I think that my, my deviation from a happy, what could be considered a normal childhood, was when a, 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 a man from my church began to molest me. It began when I was about eight, and it continued up until, I believe, about 11 and a half. And it was about that same time that I discovered my father's pornography co uh, collection. And I remember as I looked at this pornography and I would see the images of these people having sex, I would try to reconcile with what I saw with what was happening to me in my real life. And I would look, and yet there was no reconciling it. And, look, and I'm not sure which was more damaging to me whether the actual molestation or knowing that while my father was sleeping with my mother that he was having these affairs through his use of pornography. You know, I can remember uh, as I had grown up a little, little older, early adolescence, the, uh, the sexual abuse had stopped. I was old enough and strong enough and mature enough to have put an end to that and separate myself from this man that had been hurting me. But I was also very active in my church, and my church is, was the environment where this man had gained access to me. And so I, I can remember feeling this great conflict between what I heard at church that God loved me and God loved all the little children, and yet it was also the environment that brought this horrible pain into my life. And I can remember sitting on my bed reading my Bible because that's what I'd been told I was supposed to do. And as I read my Bible and I would pray that somehow, some way, God would make some, something useful of my life. And God was silent to me at that time. I grew up in a very sad and dysfunctional family. I, I was a boy really left without protection by his own family. Not because they were bad, it's just that they, they just didn't have the emotional and mental resources to notice how vulnerable their children were. And this man, he masqueraded as a uh, happy and well-adjusted man within the church that I went to. He was a great actor. And, um, you know, I've learned that I don't need to judge this man anymore. That's God's job. I don't know what happened to him to make him the way he was. I remember that there was a time where I would think that if I could ever get away with it and that I wouldn't get caught, that I would kill this man and never blink an eye. Now, I know the man's not alive today. He's, you know, I was a little boy at the time, so he has since died of natural causes. But if he was still alive and I'd see him today, I would not harm him. He certainly wouldn't be my friend. And I certainly would confront him. But he has to face his God, just like I do. I don't think I told my family because that was, my family was all about secrets. My father's porn addiction. Uh, we had uh, layers, generational layers of, of really very sad, lonely, desperate secrets going back generations. We didn't talk about what was really going on with us as individuals. We would find someone else to pin the blame on, so to speak. There was something imposed on me, and that was a belief that I needed to handle this by myself. That if I asked for help, the help would not be there. Being molested by a man for me did create great confusion. I remember early adolescence seeing uh, men just express normal um, affection for one another, maybe a hug or a, an endearing handshake. And even that was very threatening to me. I knew on the one hand that I really, really liked girls, but I was so frightened from them. Uh, I was frightened of them, and I felt guilty about how I felt towards them. I knew that I didn't want to have anything to do with homosexuals, and yet I, I was afraid that homosexual people were everywhere. 
And um, so I was alone. I was stuck. Um, on the one hand, I, I, I was fairly certain of my physiology and of the direction of my passion as a, as a growing, healthy young man who was attracted to women. But I didn't know how to communicate that. I didn't know how to express that. And um, so I was kind of kind of caught up in a no man's land of, of spiritual and sexual development. I think without knowing it, I was, I was caught up in a longing for God and a, and a deep distrust of God. Um, certainly I had been ingrained with the uh, belief that I was supposed to be a good, godly man. Yeah, I didn't know exactly what that meant. I had a deep longing that I could never quite express, never quite get my hands around. I could never quite define it. I didn't know where to put it. And um, I would go through periods where I was intensely seeking spiritual things through reading my Bible and, and uh, attending church religiously. I was taught that church is where the good people went. And if you wanted to be a good person, you're supposed to go to church. So that's what I did. I'd go to church. I wanted to be a good person. In fact, as an adult, before, before my moment with God, I, there was a period of time where I would generally go to church on Saturday nights because I knew I'd never get there on Sunday because I'd be too hungover. And, I'll, and so what I would do is I would go to church, I'd stop by a coffee shop, I'd get me a cup of coffee, but I'd pour the coffee out, and I'd fill the cup full of vodka, and I'd go sit on the back row of church sipping my coffee because that, the vodka in my coffee cup helped me get through church. And then after church, I would run to my car where I'd do a little cocaine and then go down and see my stripper girlfriend. And I would talk to her about what the preacher had talked about at church. Somehow or another, trying to reconcile the religiosity of which I was raised in and the reality of my life as it was that day. As I got older and I moved away from just you know, looking at pornography and, and found myself dating uh, dancers in, in strip joints. And I worked in, in strip joints as, as a doorman and a bouncer. And then along with my girlfriend, we became involved in the pornography industry. And by that time, I had a pretty nasty little drug and alcohol habit. And so this is how we made our money to live and to, and to um, get our drugs. And I've come to think of pornography like a drug. Now, I am a recovering alcoholic, and I'm a recovering drug addict. I used to smoke my crack, and I would drink my alcohol, and I would take the pills and do whatever to get that stuff into my body. Well, the pornography, I just ingested through my eyes. But I believe at the brain chemistry level, and even at the level of our cells in our bodies, that pornography has a drug-like effect. And people um, are very capable of becoming addicted to pornography just like they're capable of becoming addicted to drugs. And I don't believe that anyone is immune to that. The most honest prayer I've ever prayed in my life was uh, when I looked up at the stars one night and um, I said, God, I don't know who you are. But if you don't help me, I'm going to die. I'll call you any name you want. I was willing to become a Buddhist or a Muslim, Hindu. I would have been anything. I just didn't want to die. And a few minutes later, standing there in the cold as my hands shook trying to light a cigarette, I believe that I heard a voice. Now, I don't know if I heard the voice through my ears audibly or heard it just resonating in my heart. But this voice that I heard said to me, all right, David, now I can go to work. And I was stunned. I was floored. First of all, that I had called out to a God, and for the first time in my life, God responded by calling me by my name. 
He wasn't telling me to go to do something. He wasn't telling me to walk down the aisle or fill out a car to go knock on somebody's door and tell them about church. He just said, all right, David. He called me by name. And I didn't know exactly who that was. And I've come to realize and really appreciate the humility of God. And that in that moment, he let me know that he loved me and he didn't expect me to figure him out. He didn't expect me to have my theology right or my doctrine right. He just wanted me to know that he was there. And over time, I've become to realize that my previous life where I longed and waited for that time was just simple preparation. He wasn't holding out on me. He was allowing me to be prepared. I believe that being a healthy human being requires that we have what I call a binocular view of life. I'm, I'm a sportsman. I like to be outside, and I have a pair of binoculars. And each eye looks through a different lens. But they, they bring you into focus. And I think God wants me, wanted me to have the experience of that 40 years. I was 40 years old when I prayed that prayer. Of the, having that 40 years of indescribable aloneness. In order so that when he came and met me and gave me a growing and developing vision for the future that he would give me, that that would bring me into focus on how I was supposed to live today. And it's been that focus that has changed me and has empowered me, not easily and not without pain, but to become the kind of person where my involvement in drugs and alcohol and pornography just don't make sense anymore. Now, I've never forgotten how much I love to be high. I've never forgotten how much I love to be drunk or the thrill of my promiscuous lifestyle. But it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. I have a life that's worth living now. My life on the surface really hasn't changed a whole lot. I still live in the same house, same neighborhood. I have less money today than I had when I did drugs. Um, I certainly have not gotten the life that I had defined for myself. But what I have come to understand is what it means to live with the indwelling, indwelling presence of the Creator. I am perfectly at home in this universe whether it be in this body or in eternity. Heaven for me has already started, not because my life is so great. My streets that I walk on are certainly not paved with gold. But the everlasting love of God is mine. God's commands and his call to obedience is not some sort of arbitrary list of do's and don'ts. It's because he's asking me to do and live my life in such a way that it's good for me and good for others. And that this life I experience, I, I have, and even though I am obviously well entrenched and middle-aged, but my life is expanding, it's growing. And that's a great thing because prior to, my life was always a, this desperate struggle to survive. Because it wasn't a life, it was just a death where my heart hadn't stopped beating yet. When a temptation hits me now, I do two things. I remember what the inevitable results have always been, the misery, the pain, the sadness. And not just for me, but those around me as well. And I also remember and I think about what God has laid before me. If I move in obedience, I have an opportunity to swim deeply into the mystery of God's goodness as he lays it before me. I have the opportunity to become a part of eternal love and to experience it play out in my life even that day at that moment. But if I sin, which I so often do, I have the opportunity of confession 
But as I confess my faults and all my foibles and all my sinfulness, God has moved me and redirected me back into that opportunity of goodness and love.